All right. Well, no, count me in. <laughs> They're going to hear me count you in. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Bruce County Public Library for this live presentation. My name is Nancy Cool, and I'm the program coordinator for Bruce County Public Library. Today's presentation uh, recognizes Canadian St Storytelling Day, which is November the 7th. This day began in Aurelia in 2012, and it's an opportunity to share Canadian stories, a time to gather at the turn of the year when the nights grow longer and colder. Bruce County Public Library is happy to host one of our own library staff for Canadian Storytelling Day. Jeremy Clark was the community services librarian for the Nunavut Public Library Services in Baker Lake for two years, during which he flew a lot. These days, he's the Digital Initiatives Coordinator for the Bruce County Public Library in Port Elgin. He enjoys the unpredictable winter weather here, as it sometimes reminds him of life in Baker Lake. Jeremy joined the BCPL team almost two years ago and has been integral in helping both staff and the community enhance our technology skills. So before we get started with Jeremy, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Following our introductions, Jeremy will begin his presentation. While listening and watching, we encourage you to submit any questions or comments to our web form on the Bruce County Public Library website, and you should be able to see that uh, uh, URL on the screen here or in the comments during the presentation, and then we'll address your questions following the presentation. Um, if you don't get a chance to watch live this afternoon, uh, this presentation will be recorded and posted here on the library's YouTube channel um, in our special guests playlist. So, and you will find the recording there so you can watch it later and share it with your friends and family. Okay, so uh, hello and welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your stories and photos with us. Well, thanks um, for having me, even though we nope. work 12 feet apart. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, because I work with you, I've heard some of these stories before. Um, so when we were thinking about Canadian Storytelling Day, I um, thought, well, why not have Jeremy tell his stories about working up north? Um, they've been a huge hit in the office here um, and share them out in the world. Uh, they're so entertaining and a neat glimpse into what it's like traveling around the north. So I understand today uh, we'll hear a few of our, our own favorites here at work. Uh, we'll hear about the never-ending crisscross of flights over a Thanksgiving weekend, uh, the frozen broken wedding plane, uh, and yeah, happy to say that one has a, a happy ending. <laughs> and in general, the stark differences uh, between the experience of flying up north and say flying into Pearson in a 747. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, let you start. All right, thanks, Nancy. Um, another note for people watching, I'm coordinating both the streaming end of this and my PowerPoint and images. So if at times I look off into nowhere, I'm just looking at one of those. Um, so yeah, we'll move over to the first bit of the presentation. Uh, that there is me, my face is frozen. I totally loved it. The person cut off to my right is my wife. We were just engaged at the time. Her face is as frozen as mine, but she was wearing a full balaclava because she doesn't like the cold as much as I do. Um, yeah, I spent a couple of years living in a town in Nunavut called Baker Lake. I loved every minute of it. The cold has always been my thing, as have small towns and darkness. So winters in Nunavut appealed to me in particular. Um, a cousin of mine had worked in Cambridge Bay um, in the western end of the territory, uh, close to where they found the Franklin ships a few years ago. And then she moved on to Iqaluit, and I had always wanted to take in some of the experience that she had talked about and was very glad I, I got a chance. Um, I think any Canadian who can find the time and the money, it's kind of expensive, should visit Nunavut. It is a stunningly beautiful place with wonderful people. Um, as part of my job as community services librarian, we've got a little uh, picture. Oh, sorry, I had the wrong thing up. Got a picture of our office here. This was after a blizzard in my second year there. You can see where the arrow points to the front door. You, of course, can't see the front door. Uh, that blizzard went on for about three days. That's me in the photo there with my boss's dog. Um, blizzards were usually just a day or a day and a half. Occasionally, they just went on and on and on. Baker Lake is in the central part of Nunavut, a region called the Kivalik, and it's crazy flat. And there are no trees and the wind just blows. And when it blows, there's nothing to stop it. There isn't a windbreak for a hundred miles in any direction. 
And during blizzards, depending on the direction they came from, most of them came from the north, snowdrifts would form in different places in town, but they were always in the same place. And you can see that I'm basically just standing on the ground there, just to my right in the picture, that, that sort of pinkish area, the dirt in Baker is super red, um, is just the ground. But then, you know, three feet behind me, it's seven feet deep and it, it's hard as a rock. You can walk on it, but they always formed in the same places. Luckily for me, one of them was right in front of my house. And after this particular blizzard, the drift in front of my house was about 12 feet tall. It took them two weeks to finally get around to digging us out, in which time our building ran out of water, which was super awesome. But when you looked out the window, you would see people driving over top of the 10 feet of snow drift, which was always kind of fun. Um, Oops, sorry. So what you see in the left there is Baker Lake uh, from above the airport specifically. And on the right is the interior of the airport. To give a little background for what the average airport is like in Nunavut, uh, Baker's runway there is gravel, which most of them are. Um, and for any aviation nerds watching, it is 4,195 feet long. Um, as a Nunavut airport, fun fact for those same aviation nerds, the Iqaluit airport was at one time designated as an emergency runway for the space shuttle in the event that it ever re-entered over the Arctic and couldn't make any of its usual runways. The little circles you see on the map there indicate where the space shuttle would have wound up if it ever tried to land in Baker Lake and its much shorter runway. It would have either been under 50 feet of water or crashed horrifyingly in the rocks north of the airport. Um, the picture there on the right that shows the Nunavut airport really shows you effectively the entire Nunavut airport. Um, about six weeks after I started in Baker, uh, this is the story I sometimes call the frozen broken wedding plane, I flew home for my wedding. My wife, who'd seen a map of Canada, gave me this sort of rough diagram here of places she would and would not live. She's not super fond of the cold. Um, so my, my initial flight into Baker Lake had been pretty uneventful. Um, the, most of the airlines in the north fly a plane like the one here. It's called an ATR. It's made by a French manufacturing company. And you can see in the diagram below how they often lay them out. They're what they call combi aircraft. They fly passengers and cargo. And the passengers are the far less interesting part of the flight to the airline. So... On the morning I went to fly out, I hopped in a taxi, they're $10 back and forth to the airport with 17 other people and you wait about a half an hour to get one. Um, and when I hopped on the plane, I did what you would normally do if you'd gotten on a plane and were wearing a coat. I took off my parka, I stashed it with my hat and my mitts in the bin above me and settled into my chair. About three minutes later, I was frozen mostly solid. I hadn't been waiting on one of these combi aircraft before and had an experience that when the rear passenger door, the front cargo door, and the interior connecting door are open, the wind just blows through the plane. I checked the historical weather for that day. Uh, it was minus 46 with the wind chill, 40 kilometer an hour winds, which were blowing straight down the interior of the aircraft. A very ordinary winter day in Baker Lake, but super unpleasant in a t-shirt in a frozen wind tunnel. Um, I grab my coat and put it back on, and about two minutes after you take off, the plane is 100 degrees because the bleed air from the engine is incredibly hot. And I had to get back out of my murderously hot parka, but I had to sit in it while I waited for the captain to turn off the seatbelt sign. And on these short flights, sometimes they don't do that because cruising altitude is the same word for the altitude at which you start descending again, but I got lucky and was able to stand up. When we were ready to go, this was sort of my first real northern flying experience. The pilot started the engines, but, oh yeah, there's me frozen in the interior of the aircraft. When the pilot started the engines, the engines did not start. No matter how many times you could hear them attempt to start the engines, the engines would not start. Normally, you would solve this problem with something called a ground cart. And there's a picture of one here. It's basically a mobile power unit that can connect to the plane, except the ones in Baker Lake were out of service. I was inside the plane, which made it kind of hard to see what the maintenance guys there did, but eventually they gave up on the ground cart altogether. It would not start the plane. And so 
I saw a truck head out from the airport. We'll get into the relationship between trucks and Nunavut airports in a bit. And they, so they used a truck, they grabbed a ground cart and with a bit of, well, the formula indicates magic, they got the plane started and off it went, much to my delight. But heaping joy upon joy, uh, this flight was a milk run. It stopped in all the little towns it could possibly find before finally leaving from Churchill, Manitoba for the long, loud turboprop flight to Winnipeg. Um, the milk run flights were common. They weren't super annoying for someone like me who thinks the takeoffs and landings are the most fun of flying and the bumpier the better. Um, but they were a bit time consuming. So we left Baker. You can see uh, Baker Lake, it's a bit hard to see. It's kind of in the lower middle part of the map, straight up from Manitoba, just inland a little bit. It sits unimaginatively on the shore of Baker Lake. And so we left Rankin for Chesterfield Inlet, and then we flew on to Rankin Inlet. Rankin Inlet is the local hub, so a lot of planes are always coming in and out of there. The airport there had, or has, I don't know if it still has them, incredibly delicious hot dogs that I got every time I was there. We bounced on to Whale Cove, Arviat, and then popped down to Churchill, Manitoba. And I have here, I think, a picture, yes, of the Churchill, Manitoba airport. There is somewhat more to it than this, but I always kind of liked this part of it. It had not nearly as good food as available in Rankin Inlet, and it was twice the price. I didn't usually bother eating there. Um, on the flight from uh, between the two shortest tops on that uh that flight was the first time I had experienced what I mentioned before, a pilot, you know, the plane getting up to the cruising altitude, the pilot comes on and says, we have reached our cruising altitude of 5,000 feet, blah, blah. You heard him ding off the microphone and immediately ding it back on. We have now begun our descent into Chesterfield Inlet. I kind of laughed out loud at it. No one else on the plane did. I suspect they'd heard it a few times before. And so we left from Churchill to Winnipeg um, and in a jet, it takes about two hours. Most of the Northern Airlines have jets that they use for longer flights. Um, but this particular flight was on a turboprop. If you're not familiar with planes or you haven't had the joy of a turboprop before, it's the same engine mechanism as in what you would call a jet engine or a turbofan engine, except instead of blowing the air out the back, it's connected to a propeller that spins a gajillion miles an hour and is basically a giant deafness machine. Um, I like turboprops as they kind of made bumpier flights. They made more interesting flights, but that noise was really damned annoying. If you've never had the pleasure of riding in one before, it's kind of like sitting next to a leaf blower about 20 feet away for four hours. If you ever get a chance to fly on one, you should take the opportunity. Um, they are an interesting experience. Um, I initially ended the story here, but my coworker Nancy highlighted for me that I didn't tell anyone if I ever made it to my wedding. Uh, yes, I made it to my wedding. Our wedding was in Windsor, which was followed by a honeymoon in Cuba. And on the way back from Cuba, I boarded a plane in Veradero where it was something like 102 degrees that day. We landed at Pearson, went in through, you know, the usual jetway into the airport. My wife went home. I waited for a flight to Winnipeg. Back on the jetway, flew to Winnipeg, jetway into the Winnipeg airport, jetway back to the plane, and finally got off the plane in Rankin Inlet where it was 55 odd below that day. The previous time I had been outside was 100 some Fahrenheit, and the next time I stepped outside was about 65 Fahrenheit, and that was the last time I made the mistake of not packing appropriately to change as the day went along, because that was kind of annoying. Um, one of the other sort of highlight features of airports in Nunavut was what I called the luggage F-150. Every airport had one of these. Instead of what you would see at a larger southern airport where they have dedicated equipment for carrying luggage around, wherever you landed in the north, a pickup truck pulled up to the back of the plane, they popped open the door and flung stuff wildly out of the luggage compartment. Because most of the flights had a lot of stops, the luggage was loosely structured in the plane so that they didn't have to search for stuff. Um, but there was nothing particularly delicate about the manner in which they moved the luggage from the back of the plane to the luggage F-150. The truck usually also doubled to push planes around if they needed to be backed up at any point. Um, and 
routinely as you would either watch them bring luggage to the plane when you were already on board or taking luggage away from the plane, you would see it fall off. When my cousin lived in the north, she watched the luggage pickup truck uh, back over her bags once. When they fell out, someone noticed the truck stopped and backed up, but didn't stop before they got to her bag and or bags and backed right over them. That did never happen to me, but I learned from that experience and only packed things like clothes and extra pairs of shoes in my bags. Anything even remotely susceptible to the weight of a truck went with me on the plane. Um, and the luggage experience, once you got to the airport, if you were at a larger airport like Rankin or in Iqaluit, your luggage would move into the building and there was what you would recognize as sort of a baggage carousel, but it didn't work like you expect them to. Airline staff from the desk in the airport would come over and as staff pushed the bags in from the outside, they would simply grab them and lob them to the end of the little sort of one way, you know, baggage conveyor. The conveyor never actually worked, which is why they had to do it by hand. And the staff outside were bringing them in way faster than they could claim them. And so you couldn't claim your luggage as it came in. They would simply lob it to the end of the conveyor and you would pick it up as you came to it. Um, in a Callowit, this was magnified by the fact that often the planes were much larger. They were flying 737s and there were more people on them. And people would crowd around trying to claim their bags while the staff were flinging them around. It was usually quite an experience. After a couple of trips through a Callowit, I learned that it was just simpler to wait in the nearby, you know, passenger waiting area until everyone had claimed their bags because otherwise you were just fighting with everyone and it was crazy annoying. Um, at some airports, you would, um, they had no interior space for luggage at all. You would get off the plane, walk out through the airport, and then they would deposit your luggage like in the gravel or on the snowbank outside of the plane, um, which was particularly fun when they lost your luggage, which there will be a little more about later. Um, the uh, Just deciding which direction to go next here. Um, the uh, Our regional hub in Baker Lake was in a place called uh, Rankin Inlet, which I'd mentioned before, they have a long paved runway. And like the other hubs in Cambridge Bay and in Iqaluit, a lot of flights come in there and they all come in at once. You know, all the flights will land within a 60 or 90 minute window, maybe two hours, because the airlines have passengers transferring from uh, from one plane to the next. And so you can see this is a this is kind of a shot of the the Rankin Airport here out on the apron, uh, a fair distance away. The the plane in the background is is one of the ATRs I mentioned before. That's a calm air flight. Um, there was never anything calm about any of them, though they did, I suppose, fly through the air. Um, and because there would be a dozen or more planes on the apron at once, they didn't want passengers just milling about like you would at any other airport in the north where you walk to and from your plane. The first time I landed in, in Rankin Inlet was the day that I flew up to start my job to move to Baker Lake. And when the plane landed, it, people stood up, but we weren't getting off the plane. And it's not like we were waiting for a jetway or anything like that. And eventually people started hopping off. And when I got to the door, I, I went down the few steps and there was a school bus waiting there, which was confusing to me. I followed everyone else onto the school bus. I was wearing a parka, big boots. I had a couple of bags with me and it's a standard school bus. They're sized for school kids, right? And so I wrestled my way to a seat and then it drove the 115 feet to the airport and we repeated the process and got off. I learned after asking someone that that's because they don't want people milling about on the apron, but it always drove me nuts. And every flight I ever took went through Rankin. Every flight from Baker stops in Rankin. And sometimes it would be so crowded if you'd arrived after a number of the other flights had arrived. There was only one school bus. You just had to wait and wait and wait. And the plane's super hot at that point and you're wearing a parka because you're getting off soon. And I resented the hell out of it every time I landed there. I couldn't stand it. It drove me nuts. 
And then about a year and a half into my time there, I landed in Rankin Inlet and we, uh, we parked in what would be sort of the back and to the right of this photo um, near one of the maintenance hangars. And we hopped off and started walking. I had a look at the weather for that day. Uh, it was minus 52 with the wind chill, winds of 38 kilometers an hour. And on an open runway, there's not really a lot to hide from the wind. And I, and I tugged my parka shut and I, I put my toque on, grabbed my mitts and just sort of buried my chin in my chest. And after about a third of the distance, it was maybe 750 meters, I had started to to get a little headache. I don't know if other people listening experience this, but when I have a cold wind, not any cold air is fine. I love the cold, but a cold wind blowing on my forehead makes a headache. The stronger the wind or the longer I'm in it, the colder it is, the worse it gets. And after about two thirds of the distance, I, my head was hurting so much. I, I could barely see straight. And by the time I got into the airport, I was just kind of stumbling around. I probably looked like I was drunk. Um, and that was the last time that I ever resented the bus. The bus wasn't just a safety convenience. It stopped you from having to wander a kilometer across an open runway in the middle of a freezing cold, windy winter. Um, the, uh, the story that the people in the office here found the most enjoyable when I told it, we had a, a coworker here who, when she found out I was doing this, excitedly asked, are you going to tell that the story about when you flew forever on Thanksgiving and they lost all your stuff? And I said, yes, yes, I will. And I have to tell it, you know, relatively close to the start, because if I don't, it just takes too long to tell. And I, I spent an evening putting my, my notes together for it. it. It has a lot of moving parts and it was kind of difficult to remember the exact sequence, I think in part because it was six years ago and in part because a substantial portion of my personality wants to erase the memory of that weekend altogether. When I, uh, when I traveled for work, I, I was responsible for visiting our branches as often as our budget would allow. Flights, hotels, meals are incredibly expensive in the North. Um, I, uh, we would usually book me out for two weeks, um, so that I could, you know, if I went to Baffin Island, I could visit three or four branches, or if I went out to the Western end of the territory, uh, known as the Katikmiat, I would have enough time to connect my flights in Yellowknife, because you always had to wait an extra night. And because it was so expensive, we didn't get a lot of chances to visit. And there had been no one in my job before I got there for about three years, so the branches just hadn't been visited in all that time. And so we usually booked um, over two weeks. I would just stay wherever I was on the weekend. I always enjoyed that. And so we planned a trip for me to, uh, to visit the western end of the territory. The towns are Cambridge Bay and Kugluktuk. And so I left from Baker, flew to Rankin Inlet, and then over to Yellowknife. It only takes a couple of hours to to fly in the jet to Yellowknife. The food on the Northern Airlines, I don't know if it still is as a few years have passed, but it was amazing. Particularly if you caught a flight out of Winnipeg or that had food still from Winnipeg, they got their flights catered from a little eatery outside the security area at the airport there. And it was delicious. I was always trying to bum extra meals off the flight attendants. Um, but so by the time you get to Yellowknife, uh, which is nice to get to, it's a real city. When I was over there, I would make a point of getting my haircut and you could go shopping because they had stores other than the one store that was in your town. But it was too late to catch a flight to Kugluktuk. You had to wait there overnight. And so the following morning, I, uh, I left for Cambridge Bay first and, and spent a week there. While I was there, um, an older relative of uh, a high school student who was working in the library, I found out, um, made a lot of fantastic handmade clothing. And so I bought a bunch of it when I was there, four or $500 worth. It was really great stuff. And I, uh, I was there for about five days. I packed up my stuff to head out. Someone from the hotel, they always drive you to and from the airport because no one, you know, has a vehicle. Staff from the hotel took me over. I checked my, uh, I had two bags to check. It was always kind of annoying to carry them on the plane because you had to drag them around the runway with you. So I checked my two bags. I took my laptop and my camera on the plane with me and uh, took off for Kugluktuk. 
We landed in Kug, which is what everyone calls it because it's easier to say. Um, I went outside the airport. There was a woman there from the hotel. The hotel is the Copper Mine Inn, a wonderful place. Kug Luktuk was known as Copper Mine for a number of years before as part of a naming project. Um, it was returned to a more traditional name. A number of towns in Nunavut are doing this and the government is looking into it, as far as I understand, for all towns. Um, but the hotel still bore the old name, Copper Mine. And uh, she directed me to where they bring the luggage, which was a snowbank beside the parking lot. And I went over and uh, only one of my bags was there. I waited a few minutes, nothing else appeared. So I uh, gave it to the woman from the hotel and said, I, I got to run in and have them check the plane because the flight had more than one stop. Sometimes your luggage gets, gets mixed up in, in, the, in the luggage hold in the plane. And so I approached the woman working at the counter and mentioned that one of my bags was missing. And she looked at me in a way that suggested she didn't care and she didn't know why I cared either, which was a little off-putting, but whatever. I um, I asked her if she could send someone out to check the plane. She did. They came back after a few minutes and said, no, my bag's not in the other. It must have gotten left behind in Cambridge Bay. That's not uncommon. Bags get mistagged, or if the plane is going to be overweight, they will just leave bags behind. The bags catch up to you later invariably, either at your next stop or the airline will fly it to whatever town you live in for you. Um, and... I asked if I could file a missing bag claim to get the, you know, this is just a piece of paper to fill out. And she gave me that same look she'd given me before, like, why do you care about this? And I'm thinking, well, there's hundreds and hundreds of dollars of nice new clothes made by a woman in Cambridge Bay that I want back. Um, it also had my indoor shoes and walking around in insulated boots indoors really sucks. So she told me that, um, I could start that when I got to Yellowknife. I could talk to one of their agents there and, and they would do it for me. Um, so we we went back to the hotel. I, I, had a, I had a good week there. The hotel was a particularly interesting place. Um, it had uh, mounted animal heads all over the place. And as is common in most hotels that I stayed in in the north, you know, they make your food for you. It'll either be buffet or they'll have a very small menu for each day or just one item they made that day you know, take it or leave it. And you share your meals at tables with the other people that are staying at the hotel. The North is also an exceptionally tiny place. Nunavut is about five times the size of California and has a population of about 35,000 people. Compared to the state of New Jersey, it has 0.00019% of the population density. There's a lot of room, but there's not a lot of people there. So it tends to feel kind of small. My first night, I was having a meal with two uh, two women who were staying at the hotel. I haven't been able to recall their names or what they did, but when we got talking, we discovered that they owned my cousin's cutlery. When my cousin had left the North, she had, had sold a bunch of the stuff that she didn't need to take home with her. And as a matter of coincidence, she had, through a friend, purchased my, my cousin's cutlery. And this was one of the things I enjoyed the most about flying and traveling in the North was the random strangers you would meet at the hotels. As any of my friends or coworkers listening in can attest, um, there's a few things I like more than talking to strangers, meeting new people. It was always an experience. Um, I spent the week there in Kugluktuk, had a good time, had a lot of work done in the library. It hadn't seen a, you know, a trained librarian in a few years. It was kind of a disaster, but we got everything back together. Um, the, the weekend I was to fly back was Thanksgiving weekend, uh, 2013. So on the, uh, on the Friday evening after I was done, I walked back to the hotel, grabbed my bags and called the woman who owns the hotel. And, uh, she came over with the van and drove me over to the airport about halfway between the airport or the hotel and the airport, which it's not like some great distance. They're about a mile apart. Uh, very thick fog rolled in like every community in the territory except Baker Lake where I lived it's, it's coastal it's on the Arctic Ocean so it's it's subject to the usual annoyances of, of ocean weather and a very thick fog rolled in and I was praying to myself while we drove to the airport you know please let the plane be on the ground already I don't want to I don't want to wait here I want to go home 
And as soon as I stepped out of the van at the airport, I heard this loud go overhead. And I looked at the woman from the hotel and she gave me the look. She knew what I knew. That was the sound of a turboprop flying about a thousand feet over the airport. Airports in the north don't have fancy instrument landing systems. If you can't see the runway, you can't land on the runway. There's nothing you can do about it. So they had flown over to look to see if they could land. They couldn't. So they'd gone on to to Yellowknife to come back the next day. And I went back to the hotel. Because it was Thanksgiving weekend, there was nobody else there. Um, the uh, Most people had left. Thanksgiving isn't a time like perhaps in the South where you would expect family to come from everywhere and stay maybe in hotels. It was totally deserted. The staff who run it live in a building across the road. It, it was totally empty. Um, that's freeing in certain ways. It, Hockey Night in Canada was on. I threw on the Habs game, put it on as loud as I want, had the whole hotel to myself. I amused myself by walking around the hotel in the dark, being creeped out by the various animal heads everywhere. They had left me a note saying that they had prepared a Thanksgiving meal for me and that I could find it and anything else I wanted in the kitchen fridge. And it was fantastic. I, I just ate and ate and ate. And then halfway through the hockey game, after I'd finished with dinner, the power went out. Not an uncommon thing again. I thought it was perhaps just the hotel. I looked out the window and it was just pitch blackness in all directions. The only thing you could see was the odd emergency lights and a gazillion stars overhead. I waited a bit, the power didn't come back on. The hotel passed from amusingly creepy to too creepy in the pitch black, so I just went to bed. In the morning, I called the woman from the hotel. The flight, the next flight was supposed to land at six or seven. We went over to the airport. And when I went in to check my bags and, and get a boarding pass, the woman at the desk just kind of shook her head at me. And I thought, what does this mean? Walked up and uh, it turns out that uh, part of the airport crew had been uh, grading the runway uh, the night before or that morning. And in doing so, they had gouged a gigantic hole in it. And it, they couldn't fix it themselves. And it was in a place that prevented the runway from being used. So there weren't going to be any flights that morning. They were kind of hopeful they might be able to deal with it by the afternoon. They said to check back. I phoned several times, but no, no luck. This was particularly galling because the other group of people I had shared some meals with at the hotel was a group of men who work for Nunavut Airports, the Territorial Airport Maintenance Service. They had spent the previous several days there fixing up the runway. They get banged up cold weather, lots of flights, all that, all that kind of stuff. And so they had done lots of work to get it into shape. And the day after they left, the local crew destroyed the runway. And the crew from Nunavut airports couldn't get back because there was no runway to land on. So I, uh, this was Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend. I went back to the hotel. I still had enough leftover Thanksgiving dinner for about 40 people plowed through it again, watched some more hockey, went on a, some walks around town, took some pictures, went to the store to get some snacks, that kind of thing. Went to sleep. Uh, the following morning, I uh, I called the airport. I didn't get an answer. I called the woman from the hotel. We drove over. I walk in and the woman's there at the counter and she's, she's shaking her head. I'm like, great. Is the runway still damaged? Yes. Have you found my bag yet? No. Great. I only had about half my clothing for a two week trip and the hotel in Cook um, was having issues with its laundry facilities after the power had gone out. So I was just sort of rotating through the same two or three sets of work clothes day after day. Um, the following morning, I phoned the airport. There was no answer. I went back out to the airport. I think the woman from the hotel was getting a little sick of me at that point. And just as we pulled up to the airport, I saw the tail of an airplane exactly like the one in the photo here sticking up. And I thought, hallelujah, the plane landed. I get into the airport. The woman is not shaking her head. I get over there. Hooray, I can leave. But no, my bag is still a mystery. No, she still didn't know why I was interested in it. So I uh, checked my bag, hopped on the plane, and we flew down to Yellowknife. When I got off the plane in Yellowknife, I, I claimed my bag. Yellowknife has a real luggage carousel like the kind you're used to. It's great. I, um, I went over to claim my bag and uh, 
found that my bag was not there. That was distressing because now I was out of everything except my laptop and a camera, which aren't really close. So I went over to the counter in Yellowknife to start the baggage claim for bags lost on two separate occasions. And the woman was beside herself. Why had I not filed a lost baggage form when my baggage went missing in the first place? So I politely explained that the staff for her airline in the airport there had told me that the proper process was to do it here. The look on her face was the kind of look you would adopt if you were trying to provide a pleasant customer service experience while in no way believing the person you were talking to. She went and grabbed the paperwork and I filled it out. And uh, that was that. Um, a short while later, my bag turned up. It had been in a different spot in the plane. Hooray, I've got a bag back. Went back to the counter, checked my bag, and went and sat down to wait for my flight. About five minutes after I sat down, I was paged over the intercom to please return to the first air desk. So I went back to the first air desk. And they told me that the flight from Yellowknife to Rankin Inlet had been declared subject to landing, which means there's crappy weather in Rankin Inlet and we may not land there. Um, because it's a jet, its itinerary is, you know, it started in Edmonton, flew to Yellowknife, flies to Rankin, Iqaluit, and then down to Ottawa. It doesn't land in the little airports. It couldn't even if it wanted to. Runways aren't long enough. They're made of gravel. They destroy the engines. The plane would crash. It's not really worth it. So I, um, I said, that's fine. You know, um, they offer you, do you want to stay here? Or do you want to get on the flight? Usually over a lengthier flight, the weather issues will clear up. It's not a problem. Um, they had to retag my bag for me um, in case we wound up going to a Callowit instead. Um, all very ordinary. So we did that. I went back and waited and eventually hopped on my flight. No sooner had the wheels left the runway when the pilot came on to let us know that the runway in Rankin Inlet was covered in ice and we would not be landing there. They absolutely knew they weren't going to be landing there before I got on the plane. But oh well, I like flying and flying from Rankin to a Callowit is two flights which means, or from Yellowknife to Iqaluit is the equivalent of two flights. And so they had extra meals. I got two delicious turkey meals. Um, flying over Rankin Inlet and landing in Iqaluit instead is the rough equivalent, both in time and distance, of flying from Winnipeg to Toronto and landing in Halifax. It's only one extra time zone and two extra hours, but you're not where you want to be. Um, so we landed in Iqaluit. As I described before, the luggage process in Iqaluit is mildly chaotic. They have since replaced their airport. I didn't get to see the new one, but I understand it's much, much better, and I really want to get there to see it. After all the bags came flying through the window and were thrown to the end of the, the uh, luggage area by the airline staff, everyone had claimed their bags and mine wasn't there. And I knew what had happened right away. When it had been re-tagged, it either... They either hadn't put the tag on it or it hadn't made it on the plane in time before they had to close it for calculating the weight. Not really a big deal. It happens. I went over to the desk at the airport to let them know what happened, um, to also let them know that I had an existing baggage claim for a different bag that was lost in a different part of my flight, that I had absolutely no clothes. And please, oh, please, did they have vouchers that I could take to the store for some clothes? Uh, instead, I got the standard useless package of essentials. It was a, a small like pencil case sort of sort of thing that had a you know, disposable razor, a tiny thing of soap as though the airport wasn't going to have soap, a comb. I've got curly hair that I don't know how to maintain. A comb is worthless to me. Um, but no vouchers. They contacted the, the hotel in town for me. They had a room if I wanted one or their plane was turning around and going back to Rankin Inlet or uh, back to Yellowknife. Uh, with a stop in Rankin. So I could just get on that flight. Um, I asked them if they knew the runway conditions in Rankin. She looked at the computer and told me that it still showed that it was iced over in Rankin Inlet. However, the other airline that operates the large jets that fly across the territory, the desk is right beside them. She said her computer showed that the runway conditions were clearing and it was a coin toss whether or not they were going to land. The airlines are generally friendly with each other. So airline one offered to um, to move my bag to airline two and my booking and uh, not my bag. Sorry. I don't have bags anymore. 
Um, and I had about a minute to choose as they needed to close the flights. I opted to head to airline two, hoping that it would land. And I was kind of sick of airline one. They lost both my bags and had already flown me where I didn't want to be. Um, I didn't really have to worry about bags not transferring this time because my bags were God knows where. Um, before I left, they did confirm for me that my second bag had simply stayed behind in the yellow knife. So they were going to fly that back for me. So I transferred everything to airline two, hopped on the plane, and about 30 minutes after takeoff, the pilot came on and told us that the runway in Rankin was covered in ice and we were going to Yellowknife. More food, you know, yay. More Yellowknife, less yay. Um, after another four hour flight from Iqaluit to Yellowknife, I arrived in an annoyingly familiar airport. I ran to the airline counters and luckily one of them had one remaining flight to Rankin that day. Um, it was the last of their flights that would be ending eventually in Iqaluit, so I had one more chance to get back. I went to Airline One's counter to say, hey, I wound up back here 10 hours later. Can I get my bag? And unfortunately, it had already been put on an earlier flight to Edmonton, which was lucky of it, which would the following day be flying across the north with a stop in Iqaluit, where it would eventually be sent home to me. I asked about the runway conditions in Rankin Inlet. They swore up and down um, that they'd be landing. I didn't trust them in the least, but I wanted out of Yellowknife. Um, so I hopped that last flight. They Luckily, the day had started early enough with the first flight that I was able to catch this third flight back, but I'd been awake for I don't know, like 14 hours at this point, and almost all of it had been spent in airplanes. Um, so we hopped on the flight, and for two kind of fitful, sleep-filled hours, the pilot didn't come on and didn't tell us anything about Rankin Inlet. It wasn't icy. It wasn't on fire. It hadn't fallen victim to any other disaster. We were going to land. Um, so the day that started around 5 a.m. with the trip to the airport in Cook had ended close to 11 p.m. in Rankin, only one flight from home. But it was way too late to get a flight from Rankin to Baker Lake. So I took a taxi to one of the hotels in Rankin Inlet. If there's anyone who's ever been in Rankin Inlet at the hotel who's listening to this, I stayed at the lovely Cynic Tarvik Hotel, known less than affectionately as either the stinky carpet or the sinking tar pit. Both were applicable. I once stayed in a room at the Cynic Tarvik where the heat was so broken and stuck on such a high degree that in the middle of winter, I was unable to cool my room by opening it into a minus 40 degree night. It was just hopelessly hot. In the morning, I went back to the Rankin Airport and had a lovely chat with the manager from the airline there. Airline one this is. He took me through all their last lost bag claim materials. I filled out all the forms. He seemed to think that some of them hadn't been filled out correctly the first time or that staff hadn't given me all the right paperwork. I hopped on a flight to Baker with mild, I guess is the right word, mild optimism that I would eventually see one of my two bags and any of my clothes again. Uh, after landing in Baker, I took a taxi home, had a shower, um, dressed in my finest remaining clothes, uh, old track pants and a t-shirt, and went to the office. Um, the day after that, I got a call from the Baker Lake Airport. My bag had arrived and could I please come pick it up? Absolutely not, no. I'm not paying 20 bucks to round trip to the airport just to get a bag that you lost while you were busy losing another one and eventually found one of, you're going to send it to me. They grudgingly agreed to put it on a taxi at their expense, and they gave the driver my name and work location phone number. Um, that entire day passed. That was Wednesday. No taxi showed up, whatever. Taxi service in the north is like if you took a taxi experience you might have had in Toronto and removed everything fun about it. Um, I didn't really expect it that day. Thursday came and went, uh, nothing there. I phoned the airport at one point. The staff member from Airline One there had simply no idea what I was talking about, and that was less than encouraging. Um, Friday came and went, still nothing. I didn't hear from them on the weekend. I had called the taxi a few times, but was told they didn't have my bag. The airport swore they'd put my bag on the taxi. Uh, Monday morning finally arrived. And at about 10 a.m., I got a call from a mildly irate taxi driver 
demanding to know why he'd been driving my bag around all weekend and would I please come get it. I was a little annoyed at this point, but I was courteous, gave him my work location, told him the story when he got there. We had a good laugh. The other bag never showed up. I lost all of the clothes that I'd bought from the pleasant woman in Cambridge Bay. Um, however, the other bag had enough clothes in it to resume working without stinking anymore. Uh, all told that the flying lasted about 15 hours. Um, I crossed through about seven time zones, but you don't get jet lagged because I was simply flying from time zone one to time zone two and then, and then back and forth again. But if you lined up all the time zones, I could have gone to Belarus. And if you lined up all of the flight miles I put on over the course of that weekend, I could have flown slightly east of Belarus. I've never been to Belarus. I'd like to go. And I kind of wish that's where I'd wound up. Um, and yeah, the, the bag never turned up again, but the onboard food was delicious. Um, I have another one here for you. The, um, I'm just going to quickly go through my slides here. Um, when you landed in Winnipeg, they often parked you if you were on the turboprop well away from the gate. The first time I experienced this in Winnipeg, I was somewhat concerned that we'd actually parked in Regina because the airport was nowhere in sight. Um, the Winnipeg airport is a lovely place if you ever have a chance to visit. It's small and not nearly as loud and annoying as something like Pearson but has delightful food. Um, I was looking for one other here and I seem to have lost it. Um, we landed on a flight at one point on another milk run in a town called Whale Cove or Whale for short. It's a standard Northern runway, gravel, not that comfortable, airport's tiny. As we came to touch down, sort of the moment the wheels hit the ground, the whole plane lurched off to the left Oh, I just got a notice from Nancy that my slides weren't changing, and that makes sense because I wasn't looking at a slide at that moment, but it turned out not to matter because I didn't have an image of the Whale Cove Airport handy anyway. So yeah, the moment we landed in Whale, the, the whole plane just kind of, I mean, we were moving forwards, but the whole plane shot to the left in a way that I'd never felt a plane move before. And like some other people I know, my go-to reaction to unexpected things on an airplane is to look for the nearest member of the cabin crew. They've seen everything. If they're not worried, I'm not worried. And I already enjoy things like turbulence and bumpy landings a lot. Terrified of roller coasters, won't go on one. But the more turbulent the flight, the better. I looked up at the woman sitting in the flight attendant's jump seat, and she just had like this, this look of terror in her eyes. And I thought, well, this is it. We're done for. Because just to the left of the Whale Cove runway from landing in this direction is a rocky cliff about 40 feet tall. And like when I say beside, I mean like it's 10 feet away from the, the edge of the actual runway. And we got, we lurched closer and closer and then we started going back again and I relaxed and then we went out again and back. And I thought the flight attendant was going to throw up. She had her head in her hands and we finally came to a stop and I talked to her and we concluded they, that they must've blown a, a tire on the landing. And uh, because Nunavut airports are small and so are the planes, you can sometimes bump into the flight crew just hanging around. And so I said, I asked the pilot, what on earth was up with that? And he said, yeah, we didn't know either. After the plane landed, uh, the co-pilot had run back down the runway to see what was up. And they found uh, that it was very, very icy and that, that they hadn't been warned about this at all, that they would have landed from the other direction or opted not to land at all. And that was probably the only time in my entire life that I have experienced true fear on an airplane. I was pretty convinced that I was going to die while doing that one. Um, I never got to visit the actual town of Whale Cove other than going in and out of its airport. So my my entire experience of the Whale Cove airport is thinking, uh, the town of Whale Cove was thinking that I was going to die. Um, you may have heard of a town called Pangnertung. It's a small town nestled into the side of a fjord um, about halfway up the eastern shore of Baffin Island. It is without a doubt the most stunningly beautiful place I have ever been in my entire life. I'm just going to bring up, we'll, we'll show you what's there in a moment here. Um, oh, 
sorry. It's, uh, oh, it was just giving me some trouble getting going there. This is the fjord in which you would find Pengner tongue. This is used, by the way, I promised I would attribute them with permission of JessPlanes.com. This is video from the cockpit of an ATR-42, one of the planes I was on, uh, flying into Pangner tongue. So the, the cliff you see on the right there uh, is getting towards where the start of the runway is. And the town itself sits on what is basically just a sliver of land between the ocean and the cliff. Um, the runway is a whopping 3,300 feet long. Uh, that's 900 feet shorter than Baker Lake, which is already short by the standards of any commercial runway you've ever landed on. Um, the uh, Pang is home to a group of people that I eventually learned were called the Screamers. Um, planes typically land into the wind as that lets them throttle back the engines because the additional wind over the wings or the additional air over the wings caused by the wind generates a bit of extra lift. So if you land into the wind, you can fly slower relative to the ground, which is pretty key when you're landing on a runway the size of, say, your driveway. So you can see Pang ahead of us there. Every other airport in the north is outside of or beside its town. In this one, it terminates in people's houses. On the right of the runway there, those houses are about 30 feet down and 100 feet away from the runway. If you skidded off the runway, you would skid into that guy's house. And so they fly down the fjord like you saw here um, because oftentimes the breeze is coming down the fjord towards the ocean, or rather is coming off the ocean, the sea breeze. And so you have to fly down the fjord and back to land on the runway. When they make the turn in the canyon, they make something appropriately called a canyon turn which means you slow down, extend the flaps to get a bit of extra lift, and you make the turn at a much slower speed than you normally would. Um, it is, in fact, prone to triggering the... Um, we'll just loop that back again for you when it starts again. Um, to triggering the stall warning, the aerodynamic stall warning in the aircraft, which goes off when you are no longer generating... It's not starting again. When you are no longer generating enough airflow over the wings to hold the plane in the air. Um, so, you know, they have advice for what to do. You tip the nose down to gain some speed. Um, and when you come out of the this canyon turn, it's designed to, it's a flight maneuver to rescue yourself if you accidentally fly down a dead end canyon and you can't get up over the side of it. But they do it every day to land at the airport. When you come out of your, your turn before the final approach to um, any airport, but particularly these ones where you're making visual landings, you need to have a, a minimum altitude in case you see something on the runway that prevents you from landing. So they came out of, they come out of the turn for this at something like 750 feet, but due to the nature of the fjord, they have to turn relatively close to the town because it gets far too narrow to land. So when you come out of the turn, there's not much, you know, horizontal distance left between you and the runway. And you've probably noticed before when you land that a whole bunch of the runway goes by out the window before you actually touch down. That's done for safety reasons. Why touch down exactly at the end of the runway? Why risk hitting the ground behind the runway when the runway is 8,000 feet long and you've got plenty of room to stop? But this runway at only 3,300 feet just barely meets the minimum landing requirements for the planes they're landing there. And so when you come out of the turn, there, there's just not a lot of distance there and they need to land really close to the threshold of the runway. And so the effect is kind of muted here. I don't know if it's because this is looking forward and I was looking out the side from which, by the way, the cliffs get terrifyingly close. The plane basically falls out of the sky to cover the vertical distance until they land on the runway. And when they land, you can feel the pilot standing on the brakes to apply more force. It's, my wife would have found it horrifying. My coworker Nancy listening to this would find it horrifying. I thought they were super entertaining. I love the landings in Penn, but there was this group of people known as the screamers who every time they landed on that tiny runway would scream basically the whole way down. Um, I got to experience this myself the mere one time that I landed there. If you've seen the movie Sully about the miracle uh, on the Hudson, there's the, 
the scene near the start where they, they have the dramatization of the water landing and the cabin crew start chanting in unison the, the instructions for what passengers should do to brace for landing, which is a scene I've always found kind of creepy. It was similar to this. I didn't know what was going on around me. I'm a, I'm a flight nerd. I knew that I the airport here, the runway was tiny and that it was going to be a ludicrous landing. But I was not prepared for people around me who'd done this, you know, dozens or hundreds of times to just start screaming in the absence of any obvious reason to scream. Um, but after we landed, it just sort of formed part of the, I don't know what you would call the novelty of the experience for me. Um, and if you ever go to Nunavut, uh, sorry, Cindy, if you're listening, I would recommend a trip to Baffin Island and not the western end of the territory, though Cambridge Bay is beautiful. Um, there is nothing that I've ever seen in my life that compares to the stunning beauty of the towns scattered around Baffin Island in the winter. Uh, Pond Inlet on the northern part of Baffin Island, uh, the only place I ever saw true midnight sun, that freaked me out, couldn't sleep at all. Um, has a large island called Violet Island, a uh, migratory bird sanctuary uh, just off the coast. Uh, you can see it from the inside of the library. Arctic Bay is gorgeous. Clyde River wasn't the nicest place I ever went, but the food at the hotel was really good. Um, if you ever have an excuse or an urge to visit Nunavut, I would absolutely recommend Baffin Island and as many small towns as you can get to. Um, that pretty much wraps up the story portion of this. I talked a little longer than I meant to. Sorry, Nancy. Uh, Nancy is going to jump back in here. I don't know if she has uh, any questions that have come in. Um, do you have questions, Nancy? Oh, I have questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, yeah, we actually we had a couple uh, questions come in while you were while you were sharing your stories with us. Uh, first of all, before I get to the questions, I do have to comment on the background that you've been using. Um, we, <laughs> Jeremy's using uh, the green screen that we uh, purchased for the library before the pandemic, so we didn't get re to really use it that much. So it was kind of nice to see it in use today. And it looks like you are piloting a plane. <laughs> I am not really in a plane, but that is the interior of one of the ATR aircraft, that same model. However, that's a much newer, nicer plane that's not being used for cargo that's more important than passengers. They weren't actually, this is like going to a car dealership and seeing it like the all leather interior, but then you buy the cloth version. It didn't actually look like that. It resembled it in that it's, you know, it's shaped like an airplane. <laughs> but uh, that's why I wrote not really in a plane there. To not the really in a plane. People didn't think I had like driven to Pearson to, to this <laughs> Anyway, it was, it was a nice touch. Um, so yeah, so our questions. Uh, so somebody had uh, typed in, what was the food like on the plane? And you kind of alluded to that a couple of times. Yeah, the, the, the food varied on the shorter flights. Some of the flights, especially on the milk runs, the total flight, like, the, you know, the, the cruising altitude was 3,000 feet and the total flying time was 15 minutes. Um, if it was super short like that, they didn't bother. But on anything more than that, um, if they didn't have um, anything catered, some of the planes, most of the smaller planes didn't have, you know, like the, the onboard galley where they could heat up food. They just had lockers to keep some food in. Uh, they would often bring around a little, uh, they would pass around. Saying all these things in 2020 is weird, thinking back to all the communal ways we shared stuff. <laughs> but um, they would pass around a basket that had uh, chips. They would offer you some small drinks. And my favorite, and now I can't remember the name. My dad's going to kill me if he's watching this. They're the little cookies with the jam in the middle. The little circle oh, of like jam. a peak freen? Peak freen, that's it. Ah, there you go. Dad loves those things. And <laughs> I grew up loving them. And so when it came around to me, I would invariably get it a package of the peak greens, but I was, a, I was a good citizen. I wouldn't take more than my share. But if I was sitting near the back, which was often the case, uh, when it came back, I would, I would nudge the flight attendant aside and ask if I could have some more because <laughs> on the larger flights or the longer flights, um, if, if you got on in, you know, I guess I didn't get on in Edmonton or Ottawa, but if you got on in Winnipeg, they had, catered food from either a local outfit or someone at the airport and they were hot meals that they would, they would reheat. And from the one, I'm going to try and find, sorry, the name of the place at Winnipeg airport at the, um, uh, at the one place in the Winnipeg airport, 
All right, Stella's Cafe or the Blue Marble? I think it was Stella's Cafe that they catered from. The food was incredible. I mean, you know, it came in a standard, um, it's a reheated airline pouch and it kind of looked like death, but it was, you know, it was real turkey breast in real as it gets in restaurant gravy with real mashed potatoes and vegetables. Um, and they would reheat it. My wife would have liked it to like, you know, the surface of the sun. Um, and they were delicious and they always had more than they needed. And that was one of the reasons I always sat towards the back of the flight. The, the planes had, your boarding passes had assigned seats. Literally nobody cared unless the plane was full and you didn't want people separated from people they wanted to sit with. But I would invariably grab a spot at the back if I could so that I could both bother the flight attendants with my <laughs> chattiness and bother them for extra food. It reached the point that on the jets, the, some of the first air flight attendants recognized me when I got on and would <laughs> serve me two meals just without even me asking. Um, you became so in notorious. General, yeah, the food was delicious. And I think I mentioned before the Rankin Inlet Airport, they have, um, there's a, uh, we got canteen basically in there that sells every uh, food in the North is extremely expensive as you're probably aware. So everything there was, it was uh, run by a fellow oh, and we and I talked a bunch. He was a relatively recent arrival to Canada and he came from somewhere that was not cold. And he had immigrated directly to Rankin Inlet. And we talked about that a lot because that would have been a shocking experience. <laughs> yeah. um, but he had these hot dogs and they were, you know, a little larger than normal, nice, nice big hot dog buns. And if you got a drink with it, it was like $14 or something, but I would always get one if they were open. Um, however, they were never open on Saturdays, which annoyed the bejesus out of me um, because I was often there on Saturdays. And then I flew there at one point and the hot dogs were different. They, they had drugs in them or something. Those first ones, I could not help but eat them. And I went there and the hot dogs were different and it, it was someone else working at it. It wasn't the owner. And so I, they didn't have information for me because I was concerned that there would be no further delicious hot dogs. The next few times I flew through there, it was the same situation, not the right hot dog, but not the owner. And then finally on one of the last flights I ever took through Rankin, the owner was there and the bad hot dogs were still there. And he said that they'd had supply problems that whoever they bought it from before hadn't you know, changed their supplier. Um, but that he was trying to find them again. And the second or third last time I ended up flying through Rankin, they had the good hot dogs and he recognized me because as you can tell, I talk too much and it annoys the people to no end. He saw me coming and started prepping a hot dog and gave it to me for free. Um, <laughs> the, uh, on other vaguely related Northern food topics, uh, ground musk ox in shepherd's pie is delicious if you cut it with bacon first because it's extremely lean. And there is no part of the caribou that does not taste good. Okay, cool. Both are very expensive to get down here because <laughs> people don't race them here. Oh, there any more oh, questions? I'll stop awesome. blathering about food. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, food's a universal topic, right? Like, talk Although about I'm afraid I've grievously offended any vegetarians or vegans listening by <laughs> pimping meat at every opportunity maybe, there. Maybe. Meat in the case of um, yeah, I did have a couple more questions here, Jeremy. Um, so you were talking about caribou, so this kind of is, is a nice little segue. Uh, what kind of northern wildlife did you see while you were up there? Did you um, see any polar bears? So, I mean, unfortunately slash fortunately, uh, not up close. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned before that the town I lived in in Baker Lake is the only inland community in the territory. It's 33, 34 communities in the north in the territory. I can't remember. The rest are coastal. Um, polar bears don't come all the way up the river to Baker Lake to eat the seals that aren't there. Um, I saw some from a distance in, uh, in Arviats, um, home of Susan Glucart, whose nephew John was the librarian when I first moved there. The yeah. North is a super small place. <laughs> um, and they have, Arviat is like the Nunavut equivalent of Churchill, Manitoba. It's, it's the next town North of it. And they have a lot of polar bears there. But Churchill gets all the tourism because it's half the price to go to Churchill versus Arviat. No two towns in the territory are connected by roads, so that's why it's super expensive to get around. Sorry, my face has gone a bit green because of the green screen. Um, I saw some at the dump there. I uh, I had someone at the hotel drive me out. I'd heard there were polar bears there. We saw some from a, a mile away. Um, Arctic hares were extremely common in Baker Lake. Mm -hmm. 
for the eight months of the year that the ground is covered in snow, they have white fur and they're, they're larger than hares you would have seen in the South. And they're extremely fluffy because they live in a very cold place and they don't live in a house. In the winter, they're like clouds, but they're very hard to spot. At least they were for me. I, at times, would be only a few feet away from one. Uh, walking between my office and my house and back uh, was at the at the northern edge of town and Baker Lake. And so it was just open, open ground past there. So there was a lot of Arctic hares that sort of bounced around there. And you would get within only a few feet of them because they would freeze when they were scared. And they would finally be so scared they would run away from you. But it would just move right in front of me. And I had no idea it was there. Um, they were very cute, but yeah, tough to spot for me. I would not have survived long having to hunt. I could never see them. Um, <laughs> wolves were uncommon and always a source of concern. The only reason wolves ever came into town is if they were starving <laughs> or rabid. Um, so a wolf in town was extremely dangerous. Uh, without fail, it would be posted on every town's, you know, buy and sell on Facebook, any local websites, it would go out on the local radio station if someone had spotted a wolf in town. Mm -hmm. uh, the same was true of wolverines. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever seen an actual wolverine, but the claws aren't dissimilar to or less frightening than the superhero wolverine. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to hang out at the garbage dumps, uh, but they are incredibly vicious and mm -hmm. very dangerous. And the same thing was true of wolverines. If you saw one, if anyone had seen one, it would be reported widely, you know, people would go out with bear spray or, you know, you'd see people driving around with, with shotguns, that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, but I didn't have to put up with the day in, day out possibility of people who lived, especially in coastal communities on or around Hudson Bay, um, of needing to carry bear spray or having to flee in terror into a nearby house because I was being chased by a polar bear. Um, of the many things I enjoyed about living in the North, I'm not too sad I skipped over that one. <laughs> um, we would see caribou from time to time in Baker Lake. Uh, during the winter, they would sometimes cross on the far side of the lake just as they were moving around. Um, that usually spawned a flood of um, four-wheelers and snow machines heading out onto the lake um, for hunting purposes. Um, I... Oh... And I can, I've got a picture here. If you give me just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, the other animal I saw irregularly were muskox. Um, they look exactly like what you'd expect. I'm told they smell even worse than you would expect, but I was never that close to a live herd of them that I could actually smell them. However, they were one of the things hunted for, um, for food and I'm just getting a picture of one here. Um, if you hold on just a moment, almost got it. So with the caribou, were they hunted year round then? Uh, yes, um, there are some limited restrictions, especially in places where the herds have dropped dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, unlike polar bears where hunting is v very, very tightly restricted, mm -hmm. um, Towns might, a town might get one tag a year and they will hold a lottery to see right. who gets the tag to hunt mm -hmm. because it's uh, financially lucrative. The An intact polar bear hide is worth quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. You can eat the meat for a long time, but mm -hmm. everyone is concerned about the conservation status of polar bears and Inuit are no different. Mm -hmm. um, so they, um, uh, polar bear hunt is extremely restricted. Just going to throw the image here up on the screen of the muskox, or part of a muskox, anyway. Um, I used to see this guy going to and from work for an entire summer. Someone had hunted a muskox, and they were drawing the head out on their step um, just down from where my office was, and I passed him on the regular. Looks like he's having a bad day. Yeah. The... Um, <laughs> The only other common wildlife, oh, well, two, I guess, um, ravens are mm -hmm. one of the strangest birds I've ever had the pleasure of witnessing. You can't watch them interact with each other or talk amongst each other without believing that they are sentient. And they are very playful. In the open space between my office and my apartment building was one of the areas that, when it was windy, would blow very, very strong. And groups of ravens would gather on the 
on the backside in the lee of the roof of a nearby building. And they would jump up into the air and just hover without moving at all. Because if they held their wings to generate lift just so, the oncoming blizzard wind was enough to hold them stationary in the air. And then when they would get sick of it or tired of it, they would just tip their wings back and the wind would catch them and they'd blow backwards. And then they would fly over and sit in the lee on that. And they would just do it over and over again. <laughs> and they would sit on the utility poles and make weird sounds at you. Um, it was my first real experience with ravens and I wish I had more. Um, and seek seeks are tiny little um, burrowing creatures that are all over the place in Baker Lake. My boss's dog had a strong prey instinct and loved to chase them, but had no chance of catching them. And I saw about a dozen of those every day in the winter. Unlike the hares, um, their colors were reversed for the season. So you could never see them in summer, two weeks mm -hmm. in August, mm -hmm. um, because they were the color of the terrain. But in the winter, they were fairly brownish. So mm -hmm. you could see them everywhere. Hmm. Um, and that about sums cool. up my experience of Nunavut wildlife. I have uh, just one one final question. Um, let's double check here. Yeah. Um, so uh, what do you miss most about being up north? Um, that's probably a toss up between several things. I'll start by saying that though I've lived in a variety of places around Canada, I lived in England for a while, I tend to keep to myself. Um, I an extremely social person in terms of a, like a need for conversation but I live in the age of the internet. I can talk to friends and family online. I had coworkers. There were two other people who worked in my office. Um, when I would get home at the end of the day, I watch TV, play video games, read books, you know, make food. Um, so I don't integrate particularly well with whatever the local culture is, wherever I go. Um, so in case you think that I'm about to gloss over Inuit and Inuit culture altogether, um, I'm not, it just wasn't a core part of my experience due to my own personality. Um, the, my boss that I worked with up there is probably the thing I missed the most. I get to see him once a year when he comes down for the Ontario Library Association <laughs> conference in January, but that won't happen this year. Thank you, COVID-19. <laughs> so I will go a year without seeing Ron. He is my library hero. I miss that guy a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, I do miss the flying, as you can imagine. Um, the northern lights are up there. During the darker times of the year, um, having access to the northern lights above you on the way to and from the office is pretty stunning. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting divide to watch because every time they came out, which was most nights, I was out there looking at them. And if there was more space weather, they call it than usual, right? Activity from the sun hitting the earth, making the northern lights they would get brighter green and you would see the curtains moving. But mm -hmm. people who'd lived there for a long time or people who were raised there barely ever looked up. And I'd imagine that would have happened to me eventually, but they were pretty stunning. Um, that's how you tell the newcomers to town, right? Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like like seeing someone walking around downtown Toronto doing this at all the, they'd never <laughs> been there before, looking at all the huge buildings. Um, I have... Um, I have a video here of a blizzard that I'll throw up in a second. This was about 20 seconds of video that I took walking home with my boss after work one day. The, uh, the town had a set of conditions. If you met any three of them for blizzards, everything got closed for the day and sent home because it would become dangerous to walk around. Invariably, every year, a handful of people across the territory would die in blizzards when they would either be out on the land, you know, they'd be visiting... Um, uh, like hunting cabins or they would just be out hunting on the land and blizzards would come and they would become disoriented. A person died just in Baker Lake before I got there. They Part of the town of Baker Lake was slightly separated from the rest, just around sort of a shoulder on the lake. And in the winter, people would walk or drive across the lake between the two. And a person, I can't remember which way they were going into town or back to their home, walked off across the lake in a blizzard, became disoriented and died. They never found their way home. The weather, I just say that so that it doesn't sound like I think the weather is all tee hee fun. Um, but when you would get sent help in the middle of the day, you know, you were, you were walking through some kind of wild conditions. The blizzards were strange. It's not falling snow, it's blowing snow. And I mean, it's not any falling snow. It's not the wind blowing around snow that's falling. It's snow that it just picked up off the ground and whipped 
200 kilometers an hour. You can look up out of the blizzard typically and see a clear blue sky, but you can't see anything in front of you. When I started there, my boss advised me to count the utility poles between the office and my house. And I had to use that once when I got to where I thought my house was and didn't, or my apartment and couldn't see the building. It's a dark green building, like the picture on, of the airport on the screen there, about 30 feet off the road. So it stands out. And I had counted the utility poles and I knew at utility pole seven that if I turned left, I would get to my house if I counted them correctly. And thankfully I had. But one day we got sent home from work partway through the day and I wanted to record a video of walking through it. Um, I got about 20 seconds of video before the camera froze and would no longer work. It turned off. Um, I think I have the sound turned off for this. If I don't, I will quickly mute it. It sounds like what you would expect 100 kilometers an hour blowing snow past a crappy microphone to be. Um, and you can kind of see us looking into the camera, trying to um, to clear some ice that had formed on the lens off. It'll be a little small at first. I'll make it bigger. Oh dear, I've been telling this whole story with the video with no audio on. I muted the wrong thing. I'll do it real quick. This was a video of us walking home. I'm getting blown around a lot. You can see that it, you can still see a bit, but in directions where there's no color, you can't see a damn thing. Um, we're wearing snowboard goggles because at minus 55 with the wind chill, um, the uh, Environment Canada puts out a warning that there's the chance that your eyeballs will freeze. But for a guy with glasses, the goggles are pretty annoying because when they fog up, you can't do anything about it. You can't, when your glasses fog up, if you tip the goggles open to wipe them off, the fog instantly freezes and then you're really screwed. Um, sorry, I ran through all that twice. I I hope my audio is properly back on. I'll, uh, I'll get rid of this video here. Um, were there any further questions, Nancy?
No, oh, thanks, random internet person. Cool. <laughs> yes. In the summer, our office here in, in Port Elgin, uh, the air conditioning is so cold. If you sit under the vents, which Nancy and I do at our desks, I love it. But I have to conduct health and wellness checks on Nancy because there's a reasonable chance she froze to death in July indoors. Um, the first day that I worked in Port Elgin uh, three years ago, there was a big blizzard, a standard sort of Great Lakes, you know, snow belt blizzard, big fluffy snow blowing really fast, blocking everything out and making it difficult to drive. I showed up at the office and the, the custodian who worked here at the time, who was a lifelong resident of the area and who hated winter, um, came over to me and said, ah, you're new here, eh? How do you like the weather? And uh, I hauled out a map and said, this is where I used to work. This feels like home. I love it. And after that, he never liked me again. So, all right. Well, thanks for listening to anyone who made it to the end. Um, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were a few more on the list, but I don't want to talk forever, so. Going and um, maybe, maybe some nerves of steel too. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah. So while uh, while telling his stories, Jeremy was uh, also the person who was uh, set up all the technical requirements today and and uh, toggling the screens back and forth. So thanks for doing that. Um, he's the technical wizard behind um, all of our our live presentations. And then also I wanted to say thank you to our communications coordinator for setting up our YouTube uh, for us thank today you. and for promoting the event for us. Um, just a reminder to everybody out there to. Uh, subscribe to Bruce County Library on YouTube so you can find more live and recorded presentations. Uh, we have stories for children, activities you can do from home, um, and all sorts of wonderful things on there. So if you haven't checked out our, our YouTube page, please go there and do so and click subscribe. Um, and then our next presentation is actually on Tuesday, November the 10th at 11 a.m. And we'll host a Remembrance Day presentation with Clive Card. Um, and it'll be on the Italian campaign. Uh, the Canadians in Italy during World War II. Clive uh, is a retired school teacher and he took a group of uh, uh, local high school children uh, to Italy and Sicily a couple of years ago with another uh, couple of teachers and he has an excellent, excellent uh, photo presentation for us on Tuesday um, in honor of Remembrance Day. So if you can join us in at 11 a.m. for that, um, it'll be recorded as well so you can always catch it afterwards. Too. So thank you again, uh, Jeremy, for sharing that with us today. And uh, happy Canadian Storytelling Day, everyone. You um, wrapped that up kind of nicely there because it sounded like you were delivering what the pilot comes on to say when you land. You know, this is Nancy <laughs> Cool. Thank you for joining us today. This Please is the end of our flight belt. schedule. The this local free. time is 325 in Port Elgin. Their next scheduled live event will take place at. <laughs> oh, and also, thank you, Carolyn. That won't mean anything to anyone. And hello, Michelle's office, if they're listening. <laughs> yes, and, and fasten your seatbelts. This presentation has ended. Thank you for joining.